Thank you very much uh, for this kind invitation, and I would really like to thank uh, Dr. Jasuja and Dr. Sagar for uh, giving me this opportunity. It's uh, really very heartening to see the crowd growing every year. This is my 10th year since I first gave a presentation in uh, about 2006, and my first presentation was on primer in interventional nephrology, and since then, uh, this, is, this crowd really has uh, grown, the crowd has matured, the, the understanding of the problem has really uh, been tremendous, and, and as Dr. Parikh mentioned earlier, that it it's, needs to be a team effort rather than trying to figure out who should be responsible. I think uh, that, that was summed up very well by Dr. Parikh. Uh, the task given to me today is how and when to consider tunnel catheter exchange. Uh, I have no uh, conflict of interest, nothing to disclose. Uh, we've talked a whole lot about permanent access uh, in the morning. Uh, I've been given the task to talk about catheters. Now, catheters can be a boon and catheters can be a curse. And some of the problems that we saw uh, in the morning sessions uh, were largely related to uh, uh, ex excess excessive use of catheters. If the catheters can be prevented, if the access can be placed, an AV fistula can be placed and planned early enough before the patient really needs to start dialysis, a uh, large number of central vein stenosis issues can be prevented. Uh, but at the same time, we do recognize that central venous catheters are uh, useful. They have uh, universal applicability. They can be used in an emergency situation. There are multiple sites that can be used, and they do not have any direct hemodynamic effect. But as mentioned, they have short -term long, uh, short, shortest long-term uh, patency compared to AV fistula and AV grafts. They have a high morbidity rate, both from infection and because of thrombosis and dysfunction, and they lead to central venous stenosis, and it, it takes a, long, uh, a, a lot of cost to maintain these accesses. So when would we consider a central venous, ex, uh, central venous catheter exchange? Now the catheters, the biggest problem is dysfunction secondary to uh, uh, non-infective etiology, that is thrombosis or fibrin sheath formation, uh, the risk of infection, which can be at the exit site or tunnel infection, and catheter-related bloodstream infection, which, of course, can lead to sepsis and mortality. And, and rarely the catheter cuff, the dec decron cuff, gets exposed, and the catheter can be dislodged or it can be easily uh, uh, removed by, by accidental tug, and, and in these situations, we can certainly try to uh, use the same access site by exchanging the catheter through the same tunnel. Talking about non-infectious cause of catheter uh, dysfunction, fibrin sheath and thrombus formation at the tip, these are the two main reasons why uh, the catheters don't function. Uh, Fibrin sheath, uh, it's, it's a misnomer that it's, it's not really a fibrin. It's, it's a collagenous layer uh, produced by the smooth muscle cells when the endothelium gets damaged during the process of place, catheter placement. And, and this fibrin sheath starts off right within 24 hours of catheter placement, and it can extend along the entire length of the catheter. Uh, as, as you can see here, the, the sheath... Uh, accidentally got pulled or luckily got pulled out when the catheter was removed. So this is, this is not a common, uh, commonly seen uh, entire length of the sheath kind of inverted out when the, when the tunnel catheter was removed for when it was not necessary. Uh, and, and, and this is a very thin layer that encases the catheter and can act as a ball valve effect. So typically when the, when the patient is hooked up to a dialysis machine, it's easy to flush the catheter, but when you try to aspirate, there is tremendous negative pressure, and the pull is very difficult, leading to very high negative pressures. Now, in situations like this, uh, when the catheter does not work, it, one, one can attempt a catheter exchange, and before attempting a catheter exchange, if we do a, a catheter gram or, a fish, or, a, or inject a, uh, contrast through the catheter, you can see a nice extension of the sheath. In this case, the catheter has been pulled back. It's a femoral catheter. And, and when, the, when the contrast was injected, you can see the length of the uh, sheath that's extending into the IVC. 
Similarly, in, a, in an I, right IJ catheter, you can see that the uh, sheath extends from the catheter tip and you can see there's a double shadowing within the superior vena cava. So the treatment of fibrin sheath uh, can be stripping of the fibrin sheath or balloon disruption followed by catheter exchange. Uh, stripping of fibrin sheath, uh, as especially in uh, North America, we rarely do this. Uh, it, it, it does not have any added advantage. Uh, as, as seen in several studies, uh, the, the immediate success is great, but long-term patency is poor. And moreover, one requires uh, additional cost because of the snare catheter, additional uh, puncture through the femoral veins, and, and it causes a lot of discomfort. Uh, more commonly used is the balloon disruption technique where the, uh, uh, the existing catheter is, the existing catheter is released, it's, it's, uh, the cuff is exposed and through the, through the catheter a guide wire is then introduced and, uh, the ca and, and, and leaving the guide wire within the tunnel and into the uh, superior vena cava, the existing catheter is removed, uh, followed up with a, a balloon, 8 to 10 millimeter balloon is advanced and uh, the entire sheath is then uh, dilated and ruptured and, and then a new catheter is placed over the same wire through the same tunnel through the same venotomy site. And, and using this technique, uh, of, uh, the adequate blood flows can be maintained and adequate uh, dialysis can be provided uh, for, for a reasonable amount of time. Uh, and, and here's how this is done. The, the wire is advanced through the catheter, the catheter is removed you advance a balloon over the wire, extend the balloon all the way into the IVC and then start pulling it back. And as soon as you see a waste, you dilate the balloon completely to rupture the sheath. And if you look at the pre and post uh, angioplasty uh, images, uh, the sheath is seen clearly here, which, uh, which well, once the angioplasty is done, you can see that the SVC is now widely, widely open and will be adequate enough to provide uh, uh, dialysis blood flow through the catheter. The next major cause why the catheter uh, leads to problem is catheter-related infections. Uh, Catheter-related infections can be exit site infection or tunnel infections. Uh, there are different terminologies that have been used in literature, CLAPSI or CRAPSI, which is central line associated bloodstream infection or catheter related bloodstream infection. And uh, the common reason why there is an exit site or tunnel infection is, is if the suture which is taken at the exit site is left for a prolonged period of time that can lead to infection. Uh, I generally don't put a suture at the exit site, try to make as small an incision at the exit side so you don't have to really take a suture and you do have the butterfly sutures that can prevent uh, the sliding of the catheter. Uh, often you see uh, infection in the tunnel with the formation of an abscess. Uh, again, these are extreme cases where there is cellulitis related to tunnel infection and in these cases there's no question of exchanging the catheter. The catheter needs to come out and, and treated adequately with appropriate antibiotics. So in, in, in tunnel infections, there's the catheter needs to come out, em empiric antibiotic coverage and catheter can then be replaced at a different site, roughly 48 to 72 hours later, and the systemic antibiotic can be, uh, can be continued for two weeks based on the culture results. How about catheter-related bloodstream infection? Is there any role for catheter exchange in this situation? Uh, as we all know, uh, it's a major source of infection. Infection rate can be anywhere from 14 to 54 percent, with uh, the frequency being 2 to 5.5 per thousand patient days. And approximately 55,000 events per year have been uh, documented in U.S. Uh, hemodialysis population, with a very high mortality rate of roughly 2,700 to 5,000 deaths per year. So clearly, Whenever there is a catheter-related bloodstream infection, that needs to be dealt with immediately. And, and the approach for a suspected uh, bloodstream infection related to catheters, uh, it, as soon as there is a clinical suspicion, blood culture should be drawn, followed with empiric antibiotics. 
And the further approach depends on the clinical presentation. If the patient presents with mild symptoms, such as fever, chills, nausea, malaise, uh, every attempt should be made to salvage the catheter and the site uh, with empiric antibiotics. If the fever subsides, if there is clinical improvement within 48 hours, the antibiotics can be con continued for two to three weeks. In case of severe symptoms, which is high fevers, rigors, hypotension, or patient has severe altered mentation, uh, there's no way this catheter can, can be salvaged. So these patients should uh, get the catheter removed as soon as possible, and these patients should be hospitalized, receive uh, appropriate care in the hospital with, with uh, temporary non-tunnel catheter to tide over the crisis. What about patients who have mild to moderate symptoms but who fail to improve within 48 hours of antibiotic therapy? Now here there's a, there's, there's a question of should the catheter be exchanged over a guide wire or should we remove the catheter, that is give a, give a kind of a catheter holiday, treat them with antibiotics and then replace the catheter at a different site uh, maybe 48, 72 hours later. Now KDOKI guidelines suggest that catheters should be exchanged as soon as possible within 72 hours of initiating antibiotic therapy, and it does not require a negative blood culture. So as long as the patient is clinically stable, these catheters can be exchanged, provided uh, the antibiotic is continued and, and a complete course of two to three weeks is, com is completed, followed by once the antibiotic is discontinued, another blood culture at the end of one week after the antibiotic has been discontinued. So from literature, again, what we know is that if the catheter is exchanged in such a situation, rather than removing the catheter and giving a catheter holiday, the, res the results are very similar. Uh, in, in, in this particular study reported in 2000, uh, the, the, it was a retrospective analysis where uh, 30, 30 patients, roughly 30 patients, had an exchange over a guide wire, and, and uh, another group had a catheter-free trial where they received, the catheter was removed, they received antibiotic, and a new catheter was placed within 3 to 10 days of uh, catheter removal. And in both these groups, the patients received antibiotics for three weeks. And the recurrence of infection, which is, uh, the, which is a common uh, concern, in both these groups were similar and statistically not significant. Uh, again, there are several studies in the literature that have shown the success rate to be anywhere from 70 to 80 percent. Uh, the study by Tendriovier, which is, which is from UAB uh, uh, in Alabama, they had a lower success rate because their, their uh, population had a higher incidence of MRSA bacteremia. So Patients with MRSA bacteremia do tend to have recurrent infections and catheter exchange may not be as beneficial to those patients. So the take home point here, tunnel catheter exchange can be easily performed with both infective and non-infective etiologies of catheter malfunction. Uh, the biggest advantage being access site is preserved and there is minimal disruption of hemodialysis schedule. Now, in, in the United States, if the patient gets a temporary catheter, we generally don't send them home, so they're hospitalized, which I know uh, that is not the situation here. Patients do go home with uh, non-tunnel catheters, so avoiding hospitalization is not something relevant uh, here in this country. Uh, that brings me to the end of my talk, so thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Tusar for an excellent talk of a difficult subject. I know Tusar is giving this kind of talk for the last about 10 years, and he has grown in stature and height. <laughs> I think uh, the most important thing, the when to put a catheter is very important. And as a nephrologist, we have to be very, very careful to decide when to put, when the patient is on long-term dialysis, short-term dialysis, transplantation, and so on and so forth. But the one thing very important what I have seen in my clinical practice is that we must teach our technicians how to use this catheter. Most often than not, we have not been able to teach our technicians to get rid of how to use it, how to clean it, to avoid infections. 
and one of the infections are there legally, medical legally in 48 to 72 hours. You have to either change the catheter and the guide wire or you have to remove the catheter, the infection is very severe. You have done a very good job in, uh, you know, exchanging the catheter and, and at least solving the, the tunnel and the catheter also and reducing the cost and the, uh, all these, these things. Thank you very much. My co-chairs, please. Thank you, Dr. Tushar, for an excellent talk. My one simple question to you is, uh, what's the maximum uh, duration of use for a tunnel catheter in your practice? Ideally, we would Generally. not. Yeah, I, ideally, we would not want the catheter to be in place uh, for more than 90 days uh, because that's the general time frame where, if everything is planned, you can have an AV fistula and the fistula can mature, and you can get the catheter out. But having said that, there are patients who have these catheters for over multiple years, and I have had a patient who's been on catheter for over four years now. Dr. Tuzar, is rate of infection is accelerated in the subsequent catheters when you exchange the catheter? The risk of infection is, remains the same whether you, once you exchange the catheter or not. Every time, as long as the catheter is in there, whether you have exchanged it or not does not really change the risk of uh, infection. What, what you achieve by changing a catheter is you, you basically take away the biofilm that's in the existing catheter and hope that uh, the new catheter that you put in will, 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 will also form a biofilm, but at least you'll have an extended patency uh, and, and use of that access. So in your opinion, what, is, what are the absolute contraindications to prevent this tunnel catheter exchange? What are the situations you won't consider at all? If, if the patient has severe uh, symptoms of sepsis, I would definitely not exchange the catheter. Uh, if there is any uh, fungal infection, I would not exchange the catheter. I would take the catheter out. Or if, if there is a clear tunnel abscess, I would take the catheter out. Thank you very much. Now, we have got about three minutes left. May I invite the house for Professor R.K. Sharma, your opinion? Hello? Yes, please. Um, how do you approach a catheter that has both infection and malfunction and there potentially is a fibrin sheath? You see, because uh, uh, to ex if it's not functioning, then rupturing the sheath may pose some problems. So how do you approach that? A catheter is infected plus is malfunctioning. Do you just take the catheter out and um, come back uh, later and put a new one? Uh, again, it depends. I mean, if, if, if the patient is clinically stable, I think that's the major uh, deciding factor. If the patient is clinically stable, I would remove the catheter and still do the rupture of, of the sheath and put in the catheter in the same site. If the patient is not clinically stable, yeah. uh, I would take the catheter out, temporize with a non-tunnel catheter and put it... I always worry that when you disrupt the sheath, you may send... Showers? Yeah. I mean, yeah, that, yeah. that can happen even if the sheath is no, infected, not infected. infected. Even if it is not infected, yeah. yeah so. Yeah. That, that's the chance we take and how often do we see clinically significant pulmonary embolism from sheet rupture? Right. Dr. Tutusha, Dr. Tutusha, here, here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, it's a very nice concept of rupturing that uh, fibrin sheet. Uh, I'm not still able to understand that. Uh, can you just explain me? The tip of the catheter and the hole, they are in the superior vena cava. Right. Okay. So, if I just exchange the catheter over the wire, the catheter will be in there. This fibrin sheath I have never seen kinking the catheter. So why do we need to disrupt this sheath? Do you understand my question? Uh, like at present what we are doing is if the, the catheter is malfunction, sure. we take the catheter out, we replace the new catheter uh -huh. and the catheter is functioning. So because the holes of the catheter are in the superior vena cava, so you hardly get narrowing in superior vena cava or in the right atrium. So why do we need to disrupt the fibrin sheet? So th there are two different pathologies that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. The fibrin sheet can extend right from the cuff all the way 
uh, extend all the way to the tip of the catheter. Yes. And, and if the fibrin sheath has extended beyond the tip of the catheter, it acts as a, as a ball valve me mechanism. So when you try to, so it's like a plastic sleeve around the catheter. And not every catheter will have the sheath that will extend all the way to the tip. Yeah. So if, if, if it is just a clot, then what you are suggesting will work, that you, you take the catheter out, the clot at the tip comes out with the old catheter, you put in a new catheter, it will work. But many a times when you do that, if the, if, if the sheath has extended beyond the catheter tip, just by exchanging, you will not necessarily f have a successful uh, functioning catheter. No, no, sure. But I'm just saying, when you remove the catheter, uh -huh. normally the sheath comes out. Not or necessarily. Not, not necessarily, of course. So is there any way to know is there a sheath is extending up to the catheter or no? So that's why you inject the contrast to see. No, I don't, but you showed the narrowing in the brachiocephalic please, vein. More discussion later on, please. Next, okay. next, okay. please okay. ask the questions. One quick question. Uh, when you exchange a catheter, would you always use a new tunnel? or would you use the old tunnel itself? As if there is no infection in the tunnel or at the exit side, use the old tunnel. Thank you. One basic question. Most of us here have a dressing over the perm cat. Is it necessary or what should be the consensus? I a dressing over the perm cat, it is not kept open because of the, 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 the atmospheric conditions and various other things and the cleanliness in the household, etc. Right. We tend to cover the catheter. But I know that uh, patients who, who come from abroad for short-term dialysis, they don't permit us to cover the catheter. What should be the consensus in our context? As long as it's not an occlusive dressing, I, I think uh, whether you put it a dry gauze with a, with a, with a tape, I think that's, that's all that is required. Uh, if it, it's not absolutely essential, there is no CDC guideline to suggest that any one kind of antibiotic cream works better than the other. Uh, as, as long as the site is kept clean, as long as the dressing is kept dry, and, and, and again, being a humid climate here, uh, changing, changing the gauze and the dressing every day probably might help reduce the infection.